Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to Humanitarian Chronicles. I am here today with a humanitarian that is definitely worthy of being chronicled, Dr. John McDougall. He is definitely someone that we need to highlight, extraordinary people doing extraordinary things, and he's one of the leading health experts in the world, also one of the best medical doctors on earth, because his patients actually get better. He is a man who wakes up every day and asks, how can I better the world, and a true hum humanitarian. So usually, Dr. McDougall, as a life coach, I tend to tell my clients, you've got to treat yourself like kings and queens. But today, we're going to hear from Dr. McDougall that that is the opposite. We need to stop treating ourselves like kings and queens, at least in the dietary realm. So thank you for being here today with us, Dr. McDougal. I can't wait to hear the wisdom that you have to share with us. And before we get started, the first thing I really would love to ask you is, I want to get this party started with a quandary that my clients cannot stop talking about and cannot stop getting upset with me about as a health coach. Oil. What say you about this crazy substance that we're ingesting? Well, first, I'd like to thank you for being so prepared for the interview oh. and uh, oh. knowing so much about what I do. Uh, thank you. Thank you for doing oriented. what you do. Thank you. Uh, you know, as you say, I'm a, you know, I'm a country doctor. Uh, actually, I'm a board-certified internist and uh, have a professorship at three medical schools. Not a big deal. I just take care of uh, medical students. Yes, and it uh, is. You know, I've been at this for almost 50 years, uh, 40 years with a dietary approach. So I have a lot of experience, and um, and I'm also, the one thing that I know you know about me is I feel like I'm the, the luckiest doctor in the world. Definitely. Because as you say, my patients get better. I just uh, finished, I, I read something called the medical letter on uh, uh, pharmacologic therapeutics, in other words, drug therapy, and I've been reading it for almost 50 years. And uh, so I'm, I'm reading it right now in preparation for one of my CME credits. And I, I, I look at the words, and they talk about things like coronary artery disease and irritable bowel syndrome and other dietary diseases, and they barely mention diet. Uh, of course, the, uh, the whole letter, the whole medical letter is dedicated to drugs. But it still surprises me now, 40 years after, or yeah, about 40 years after I've discovered this and you have and many other people have discovered the truth about why people are sick, that the medical business just hasn't budged. Right. You know, the big farm, big medicine, big food, they rule, not 99%, but I think closer to 99.99%, and it really hasn't changed. Uh, just to give an overall summary quickly before we get into the oil thing. Yeah. I'd like people to know that uh, what I teach is what I believe is the diet for human beings. Uh, there's a diet for cats. Right. You know, they're carnivorous animals. There's a diet for parrots. There's a diet for zebras, etc. There's a diet that best allows each animal to look, feel, and function their best. And there must be, likewise, with that kind of thinking, there must be a diet for human beings. You know, granted, you know, granted we can tolerate tremendous abuse you know, cocaine, heroin, half a bottle of gin a day, two packs of cigarettes, and we can live on hot dogs and, and cheese. In fact, hot dogs are wrapped in bacon and cheese, and we can live. Ugh. But, but the question is, the question should be, and everybody should have that answer, you know, every mother, every father, every spouse, and even every child, when you ask what does a human being eat, there should be an answer, and there is an answer. Yes. And I can only give you my answer, and that is that human beings are designed to live on starch. Well, I love which... your answer because I love starch. I've always been, I've always had a sweet tooth, but as you describe in the Starch Solution, your incredible book, it's the sweet tongue. Everybody calls it yeah. a tooth. No, it's the sweet tongue. But oh my God, I was doing backflips when I heard that. So thank you. I love, I love what you think humans should eat because that's what I love. So please go on. Yeah, they do. Uh, people in your listening audience, uh, they love to eat potatoes and corn and rice and bread and pasta and so on. Since I wrote that book, It Starts Solution, in 2011, which is actually not my newest book, but I think it's my best, certainly what uh, I would recommend it for those who are serious readers over anything else I've written. But when I wrote that in 2011, uh, there hadn't been discovered a 
seventh taste bud, let's say Atacan, sweet, salt, bitter, sour, uh, ugami, which is uh, MSG. Right. And then there's, there's a fat taste bud, which actually is not one of attraction, but repulsion. Wow. And so the seventh taste bud discovered in Oregon, Oregon uh, State University uh, was a taste bud for starch. What they did is they blocked the taste buds for sweet, and then they fed people things like bread and pasta and beans and rice and corn, and they found that their desire for starch, blocking the sweet tasting taste buds, starch independently was as strong as any other taste bud. Wow. So the human being is designed as a starch eater, starchitarian, starchivore, and until you get that concept uh, into your mind and into your life, you will be struggling. You will fail. Uh, if you think the answer is being a vegan or whole food plant-based diet or uh, giving up meat and dairy and oil, uh, and you don't get the starch part, then you really are still dealing with serious problems of misunderstanding and imbalance, and your life will not be under your control. Right. So it's a starch-based diet, whether it's rice, corn, potatoes, pasta, sweet potatoes, etc., with fruits and vegetables. Yay. And uh, at, at best, I would tell people, because not everybody is fully converted, I would tell people at best, animal foods are for holidays, like eggs are for Easter, and we just passed Christmas and Thanksgiving, that would maybe be a time for ham and turkey. And we just passed Halloween and Valentine's Day is coming up, and that's a day for candy. Oi! Uh, Oi! <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, in the United States and Europe and China now, and also in India, yeah. uh, holidays have become every day, three, four times a day. We start every day with Easter. We go on to Christmas and Thanksgiving for lunch and dinner, and every night after dinner we have a birthday party. Jeez. And that's why people are sick. Yeah. So those of you who, uh, uh, and I encourage you to be vegan, uh, those of you who don't, just understand that you know, almost all your diet needs to be starch-based. That means when you look at your plate somewhere around it, 90% of the food on your plate should be starch. With fruits and vegetables, you need to keep the feast days at a minimal, at a minimum, at a minimum, if you want to heal and stay healthy. Now, the whole oil issue is a, a really important issue, <clears throat> and what happens is people become vegan, but uh, too often they they go for the vegetable oils, or they have to go for the vegetable oils because their vegan diet is of non-starchy, greeny, yellow vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower. Uh, kale, you know, those kind of low-calorie foods, and they try and live on those foods, which are called nutrient-dense foods, and they go, my goodness, I'm starving to death, I can't do this. And so they start looking for calories, and they'll look to nuts and seeds and vegetarian margarines and olive oil and so on to get calories, and it still doesn't work. I mean, right. they're, they're, they're still not satisfied, and the problem there is they're eating foods that quickly turn the tables towards having greasy skin and accumulated body fat. And so they don't lose weight and they get very frustrating. So anyway, that's uh, the oil the oil is is not food. Olive oil is not food. Uh, you there's no such thing as olive oil in nature. It's always mixed up with the other parts of an olive. Uh, there's no such thing as corn oil. It's always mixed up with the corn kernel, all the ingredients. When you rip the olive, the oil out of the olive or the corn, what you have now is an isolated, concentrated nutrient, which is at best a medicine, at worst a very serious toxin. <clears throat> it's nine calories per gram, so therefore it uh, translates into body fat easily. Starch is one calorie per gram. There you go. White sugar is four calories per gram. Uh, furthermore, these oils have pharmacologic properties. They uh, suppress the immune system i.e. increased your risk of infection and also the growth of cancer and they also cause bleeding problems uh, particularly the omega-3 fats and so you're more likely to bleed to death mm. and they suppress the immune system and then your omega-6 fats from safflower oil uh, for example omega-6 fats are uh, very toxic to the artery walls to, so they promote atherosclerosis even more than does animal fat so you need to stay away from these oils in their free form. Now, you can eat them in the form of corn oil and corn. Right. 
whole and, and even if you wanted to go to higher fat plant foods like nuts and seeds and avocados, they're not unhealthy, they're just very rich. So you'll have trouble losing weight or solving problems related to weight such as uh, degenerative arthritis of your lower extremities and type 2 diabetes. And you'll also have greasy skin if you indulge in the nuts and seeds and avocados. But if you feel like you need more oil and more calories, that's where you should go. Right. But there are not, not free oils. Amen. It's just a processed food. Whole foods, babes. Whole foods. As Dr. McDougal says, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. Stop eating fat and you will stop wearing the fat. Thank you. Well, that was just the first thing that everybody's always asking me, and I'm always referring them to your book and your sites and your incredible, incredible free information website, uh, drmcdougal.com. It's incredible. And, yes, yeah, so I wanted to just start it off about the oil, but I loved everything you mentioned. How did you come to these realizations? I'd love for you to share with us your story about your residency in Hawaii and, or was that, that wasn't your residency, your, your first job out of medical residency was in Hawaii, and what you ex discovered there and how you came to these realizations. Thank you. Uh, I, I went to medical school in 1968, so it's almost been 50 years. Wow. And, uh, you know, the first four years of my education, which was medical school, was, you know, interesting and somewhat frustrating. I met Mary at the, at my, as a senior in my medical school, and you know, we actually celebrate our 45th anniversary in about six days. Congrats! And uh, yeah, well, it's been a, it's been a wonderful ride. Aww. Wonderful ride. So anyway, uh, after we met, uh, we were in Michigan, and we decided to leave Michigan. And where I went for my internship was Hawaii. We had a great year in Hawaii and didn't want to leave. And so what we did was took a job on the Big Island. I was on Oahu. We took a job on the Big Island. And there I was a sugar plantation doctor, which meant I took care of 5,000 people wow. from birth to death. I caught 100 babies. I did brain surgery in the middle of the night. I pronounced people dead at their homes. And I did everything for these 5,000 people. And uh, the first thing I learned was what a terrible doctor I was because nobody got well. I mean, they got well when they had acute problems like lacerations from their machete or broken bones. I could help them. But when they had chronic problems like chronic obesity, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, et cetera, chronic problems like your listeners and their parents have, grandparents, uh, I failed. I was a horrible physician no matter how many drugs I passed. And that experience went on for three years and then I quit and went into residency back on Oahu on, in Honolulu. I went to <coughs> a uh, internal medicine residency program. Cool. to try and learn how to be a good doctor. But let's go back to the plantation for a minute. Yeah. Uh, during those three years of my plantation work, I also had a chance to take care of people of multi-generations. I took care of first, second, third, and fourth generation Filipinos, Japanese, Chinese, and Koreans, which means the first generation, they were raised in Japan or Korea or the Philippines, and they learned a diet of rice and vegetables, no dairy, and extremely little meat. And that diet was preserved when they moved to the Big Island. The first generation stayed on their diet, their traditional diet that they learned as a child or a teenager. But the kids, they were exposed to Western living. And so the children, they ate uh, more rich food. Yep. And as a result, they got fatter and sicker. And so right before my eyes, I could see this transition, not in genetic makeup, not in heredity, but uh, clearly in their environment, which is their food. Epigenetics. Yep. Well, that's a whole other story. Yeah, that's the next video. <laughs> but yes, yes. They're, I, they're, they're lifestyle did, choices. I actually did, did an article on epigenetics and the influence of diet. So if you go to my website, which you already mentioned, drmcdougal.com, and if you look up epigenetics, you'll find a whole article I wrote about three years ago on epigenetics and how what we eat really does influence your genes currently. But it's a a much more complicated story. It yeah. doesn't deal with the obvious, which is uh, the United States, Canada, and now the rest of the world are becoming fat and sick due to what you just say and said a minute ago. You should treat yourself like kings and queens. Well, if you eat like kings and queens, you'll look like kings and queens, which means, yes, you'll be fat with a gout and so on. 
That's so it's a, it's a very simple story, and the simplicity, unfortunately, uh, results in uh, no cost, self-control, right? Self-prescribed, uh, and it just doesn't fit into any uh, decent business model. And so, even though I learned this myself more than forty years ago, and I thought the world would be rapidly changing, I have to tell you now things. Well, I can't say they're worse than they were back then, because back then there was widespread ignorance. Now, because of you and uh, efforts like like you're doing now, uh, lots of people are, are getting the message. But still, the bulk of the world's population is, uh, they're thinking it's dominated by big food, dairy, meat industry, because they have all the money. Yep. And so they can, you know, we can tell the truth for a few minutes on the internet, well, they'll take uh, three ads on the Super Bowl. That's right. And uh, they'll just tell you how good it is for you to eat a, a great American burger made of beef, bacon, cheese, hot dogs, all in a, all in a single bun. They'll tell you how good that is for you. And <laughs> if you're at the game live, they'll tell it to you in person because those are the only stands that you'll find at any big stadium. So if you're at yeah, home on your couch, you'll see it on, on the screen. If you're live in the flesh, you'll see it live because that's the food that's sold there. If there's anything green there, it's a pesticide-laden, really, it looks like a fruit or a vegetable, but it's not. That's another video, too. But uh, yeah, yeah. They, make, they make an attempt at veggie burgers sometimes, oh. but, they're, but they're not too healthy. <laughs> oh, my God. I know. Thank God for the attempts. We're getting there. I, go, I want McDougal's instead of McDonald's. I want McDaniel's, the, the Daniel diet, for God's sake. Anything, either McDougal's or McDaniel's, but not McDonald's. Please, God, that's my prayer. But, yeah, meat, eggs, dairy, oil, these things are causing devastating harm to human life. They're killing us. And why aren't there labels on these foods? There are labels on tobacco products. Every carton of cigarettes has a label. This product will cause cancer and death to you and your unborn child. How come there are not labels on these foods that have been scientifically proven to kill us? Well, you know, I, I actually know the history on that because I lived it. Uh, in 1964, Luther Terry, Surgeon General of the United States, came out with the Surgeon General's report on smoking and health, and it just devastated big tobacco. We went from a population where half the people smoked yep. to today where fewer than 20% of people smoke. Good. Well, uh, that happened uh, in 1964. Uh, in the early... Uh, in the late, in the, well, in the 60s and in the early 70s, uh, people became aware of the effects of diet on health. And in 1977, George McGovern, the Democratic senator from South Dakota, put together the dietary goals for the United States. And it told people that they need to eat less meat, less dairy, more whole grains, more fruits, more vegetables, etc. Wow. Well, big food said, we're not going to take the fate of big tobacco. And so they put all of their available uh, money for lobbyists and any other effort they could to work. And they had changed in 1977 the dietary goals by the end of the year back to goals favorable for the food industry. And they have continued to work as hard as they can to stop any movement towards saving the public from, you know, the damage and killing effects of the American diet. In 1985, Sierra Coop came out with the Surgeon General's report on nutrition and health in the United States and said the same thing. But big food fought back. And uh, every five years, the dietary guidelines for the U.S. come out. And these come out from the United States Department of Agriculture and the Department of Human Health and Human Services. And uh, these guidelines are written with the interest of agribusiness because the U.S. Department of Agriculture is manned, personed, whatever, <laughs> by people who work for industry. Right. Uh, more than half the members work for agribusiness. And so on one hand, the USDA is trying to save the public from obesity and heart disease and diabetes, but dominant to those efforts are their efforts to save agribusiness and make sure the egg industry, fish industry, uh, beef and dairy industries thrive. Right. 
And that's, that's you ask why, that's the reason why. And it continues today, even in uh, the face of the fact that we just had an administration headed by uh, Barack and Michelle Obama, who both knew, and so no, they both know the effects of the Western diet on human health. And I have to say, even though uh, I have fond feelings about the Obamas, I have to say they failed the American public. For sure. Uh, Barack Obama, whose name was Barry then, when he was 15 years old, was actually a student of mine. Wow. And so uh, Mr. Obama knew the difference. Unfortunately, probably not, well, certainly not due to his own lack of efforts. But uh, even though Michelle is a declared vegan, and Barack Obama, I believe, eats pretty darn close to the McDougal diet. Wow. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't able to make any changes that were substantial in the health of Americans. In fact, in the Obama administration, the obesity rate went from 34 to 38%. Whoa. So, you know, we're, we're all concerned about the, uh, the new election and what the next four years uh, have to offer the U.S. and the world. But I can just tell you, even though there was an opportunity to be taken with the Obama administration, with Dennis Kucinich, the senator from Ohio, and with a few other big people in the government who knew better, there was an opportunity to be taken over the last eight years. It wasn't taken. Right. And people are fatter and sicker than before. That's right. That's right. So I, 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 actually, the next webinar I, I, I'm doing, which will be next Thursday, every Thursday morning, 11 o'clock Pacific time, I do a webinar which goes around the world. They're amazing. And, uh, They're amazing. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm, thank suppo you. I'm, I'm, supposed to, I'm supposed to tell people what I think uh, the year 2017 is going to offer in terms of health and diet changes uh, for the U.S. and the rest of the world. And right now at this moment, which is Monday, and Thursday is three days away. Uh, at this moment, I can't tell you what I think is going to happen in 2017, but I will dream something up between now and then. Well, please, God. You know, I've heard Trump be vocal about autism and vaccines and diet and autism. I I've heard him say that in interviews, so I'm hopeful that, please God, <laughs> he will be vocal about the food crisis and how it causes every disease known to humans. I'm, I'm you know, hopeful. I'm hopeful. <laughs> everybody, everybody's a little surprised as to what Mr. Trump is going to do. Exactly. But you, never, you, know, but you never know. He's shocked us before, and he might pleasantly surprise us again. Let's just hope. And you are such a hopeful man, and, and you know you do wake up every day and say, what can I do to better the world? So you are living in that light. We've got to be hopeful, Dr. McDougall. If nothing else, I'm hopeful. But oh my gosh, yes, more truth, please. And I love, I love that you touched on. You went to medical school, uh, fifth, no, in '68, which was many years ago. Many years ago. Long before you were born. Long before I was born. Um, so even back when you went to med school, I know from my medical student friends that today there's barely any talk of nutrition and health in medical school. I know that today in medical school, they're teaching drugs and surgery. They're not teaching health. They're teaching a practice like an electrician. Okay. So in your day, was there more talk of, you know, like Edward Howell, Dr. Edward Howell and his research on enzymes and health or anything about nutrition and health when you went to medical school? Or was it just no. as messed up as it is now? No, it's the same. Nothing's changed. All right. Well. Uh, they, they, the, the medical students, they get biochemical formulas. They get no, and I repeat, no instruction on diet therapy. And uh, I, I, run a, I, run, I run a practice of medicine that's confined to a 10-day residential program. And we have uh, medical students from around the world that come to our program to learn about how to take care of people by changing their diet and, and uh, dramatically improving their health. You know, there are some of the few students in their class that have any interest in diet. The rest of them are interested in them, especially uh, all this taught is uh, in medical school is how to get prepared for the boards or how to develop a, a trade such as ophthalmology or orthopedics or, you know, some type of trade. This is a trade type of school. Right. 
Uh, so no, there's absolutely no edu- absolutely no education on nutrition. And when you say, well, that can't possibly true be true. Well, you could probably find me a few mild exceptions. And certainly there are a few doctors that are in medical schools that make an effort just like I do to bring forth what is true. But the overall impact on the student is they receive no practical education on fixing the problem, which is the food. Right. That's why people are sick, so as we talked about. Uh, and, and it's not going to change. In 2011, you know, I, just to kind of get to the bottom line, uh, which I'm not supposed to do, but I will. Go for it. I, I single-handedly wrote a, uh, a bill called SB 380 in the state of California, and that was in the beginning of 2011, which uh, would require medical schools to teach nutrition. Wow. Thank in the state you. of California. It was, uh, we have 11 medical schools. And it would require that doctors and hospitals around the state learn about human nutrition. So, uh, as I said, I, I wrote it. Wow. Um, it was uh, brought before a Senate uh, committee which said that we are not interested. And then after I testified a month later, it was passed unanimously by both houses in California. Wow. And then in September of 2011, it was signed by our governor, Jerry Brown, into law. Thank God. Well, but the problem is, is unfortunately, it uh, made no practical difference because, uh, well, what happened, it was turned over to the California Medical Board, which uh, decided to that the implementation of the law would be that they would provide one paragraph in their newsletter annually about about nutrition. Wow. And so, you know, that was 2011, so that would uh, be six years ago, almost to date. Yeah. And, uh, wow. Unbelievable. About nutrition yeah. in their perspective, which is the industries who fund medical schools, the dairy, meat, egg, fish, and you know, GMO chemical industries that fund education. I mean, I'm, I'm well, assuming. They, well, they I mean, do, what could they, they possibly a, write? A lot. Yeah. What, well, <laughs> what are they, they, they do have a, a big influence. So you can go to different universities uh, and you can find buildings, the biggest Chinese buildings on the university campus, paid for by various industries. Yep. So, yeah, the influence is huge. Uh, research, about 70% of the research on food, and on drugs is directly identified as being paid for by industry. Right. So the, the influence is huge. You know, but you know, again, this is not a conspiracy. Or to begin with, this is not a conspiracy. This is just business at its best or worst, depending on how you want to look at it. Right. Uh, your, your listeners need to grow up. Uh, they need to stop thinking that somebody's going to tell them the truth that uh, somebody has their interest and their children's interest and their spouse's interest in mind because they don't. Right. What they're interested in is they're interested in selling products. The bottom line, and, babe. Uh, yep. So th- that's why it is the way it is today. It's not because somebody's out to get you. It's because they're out to satisfy their stockholders and their owners and to make a, a huge financial gain in everything they do, even to the point of... Uh, Of overtly lying and being called upon for their lies. Yes. And basically say, I don't care. It's just as again, going back to our, I don't want to make this a political conversation, but going back to our, our recent election and our uh, soon to be president of the U.S., <laughs> uh, he and his administration could say there's no such thing as global warming and uh, various other completely nonsensical things. And they don't have to apologize for it or they don't have to uh, justify why they stand up against 97% of the world's scientists. Uh, They can just do whatever they want. And so it's become a world where, uh, you know, you can pretty much do anything you want and say anything you want. You can lie as much as you want, and you don't have to become accountable. Right. Uh, But, you know, that goes two ways. Uh, It also has become a world where we can do things like you and I are doing together. Yes, and we we can take and, and uh, share with people what we believe to be true, and uh, show them some obvious evidence that they can see. Not they don't have to believe it; they can see it, and uh, 
this kind of uh, information can likewise be spread right uh, just as easily through the internet so i don't know, call it a fair fight if you want we're winning we're but, winning dr mcdougall fair fight seriously well speaking of the evidence and educating ourselves you are one of the foremost experts on nutrition and health in the world and what you saw over those four generations in Hawaii. Um, could you finish elaborating on that? And could you give our viewers some, oh, sure, some sure. practical... I guess, I guess I didn't finish it. Oh, I? well, I mean, hey, you, you, well, you the, did The first generation it, but... who lived on rice and vegetables on the plantation between 1973 and 1976 when I was a sugar plantation doctor. Right. The first generation patients never had heart disease, never were overweight, never had breast cancer, colon cancer, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis. And they typically lived into their 80s and 90s working. Working. And the uh, second, third generation got fat and sick, just like the average American. In fact, in Hawaii today, the Filipinos are known for their uh, suffering with gout. The Chinese and other Hawaiian, Asian Americans are known for the highest rates of cancer mm -hmm. in the United States. Uh, you know, it was, it was a huge change in 40 years that I saw. But those of you who have been around a while or are, who are people of history, or geography, you can see this yourself. You can see that that up until recently, it was actually I dated in 1980. Up until 1980, there were vast populations of billions of people who didn't have any of the diseases I just mentioned. For example, in China, prior to 1980, when 90 percent of their diet was rice, mm -hmm. yes, it was white rice, but it was rice. Uh, fewer than 1% of the people had uh, obesity or type 2 diabetes. Now China brags that uh, over 12% of their population is frankly diabetic and half are pre-diabetic. Mm. And that's in 35 years of industrial progress in China because China is now the wealthiest nation in the world. Uh, in China, they can afford Teslas and uh, T-bone sticks. Right, right. Now, it's just, it's just a matter of economics. And so uh, in Asia these days, uh, not just the very rich, but even uh, the upper and middle class people uh, uh, look like Americans. Yep, uh, they yep. reported two years ago in India, for the first time, the middle class is as sick as the upper class in India, the mm -hmm. continent of India. So this is an epidemic that's being spread worldwide. And it seems unstoppable, except except it is stoppable and it will be stopped. And the reason it will be stopped is because Mother Nature doesn't care how much the dairy industry makes or the meat industry makes. Yep. Mother Nature doesn't care, and uh, she's fighting back with something called global warming. And uh, the sad thing is, unfortunately, uh, the consequences are going to be devastating, but things will change in, probably within your lifetime. Hopefully. Uh, likely. Like, yes. Well, no, no, they'll change for the worse. Not the oh, well, yeah, Mother Earth will fry us off this planet. She's spitting us right. out, guys. <laughs> Do something see, quick. See, Mary and I are old enough, so we probably won't see it. Uh, you know, we're both uh, 70. But uh, the, our children and grandchildren, uh, by all predictions, are going to suffer uh, you know, the greatest devastation ever imagined on planet Earth, at oh, least yeah. in human history. Well, we're already and, seeing uh, it. Yeah. The question is, can we stop it? And uh, there are some very optimistic people like uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, who did a documentary called Before the Flood, right? which everybody should watch. It's two ninety nine on Netflix, called Before the Flood. And Leonardo DiCaprio actually uh, is semi-optimistic. And he didn't even play as hard as he could have and should have the, the, uh, the card that will make the difference, which is food. Right. Oh. You see, when it comes to food, the accounts are that it, uh, at least, by a reliable estimate, estimates, at least half the greenhouse gases are being produced by the livestock industry. Yep. So, so the opportunity, the potential is that if your listeners, through your efforts, and the other people out there that uh, have their eyes opened, uh, if they can get the world to take the step of switching the bulk of our calorie intake from animal foods back to starches, which we've traditionally eaten, then we can have a heads up 
a little lead time to fix planet Earth. Oh my gosh, but, but that, yes. But that card has to be played. How can uh, we play the card to be more like the Barley Men? How do we do uh, it? Yeah. How can we do it, Dr. McDougall? Well, as you say, I get up every day, and obviously you do too, thinking how can we do it, what can we do today to make a difference? Uh, well, like specifically, what can people eat? Because when, when we talk about, oh, the starch solution, yes, guys, read the book. Watch every webinar you can that Dr. McDougall makes. They are so informative, science-based, experience-based, incredibly truthful information. Besides that, um, can you just briefly describe what exactly these barley men, a.k.a. what we human beings, all humans, should be eating? Because people think, oh, starch, great, I'm going to go eat donuts every day. I'm going to eat cereal every morning. Like, what, what does starch mean? Or what are, what are some of your examples of healthy starch that could be eaten every day? Well, for your listeners, what you're referring to, the barley men, is you're referring to the gladiators of 2,000 years ago. That's right. And these men uh, were uh, likely owned. Uh, they were the rock stars of the time. Gladiators were. And the owners of these gladiators wanted them to win. And so what they did is they provided them a diet of beans and barley. Yep. And so traditionally the gladiators are known as the barley men. And the reason they were fed barley and beans with no animal foods is because this is a competitive sport. And just like any competitive sport, be it horse racing or cockfighting or, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, the, the, the people in charge are going to make sure that their warriors are most fit. Right. So that's why the gladiators lived on barley and, and, and were vegan. But even today, competitive athletes uh, live on starch. Uh, if you look at the history since 1986, the medium and long distance uh, endurance events have been won by Kenyans and Ethiopians, whose diet is 80% starch, mostly corn. Yep. Uh, so the diet of the human being, as I tried to explain when we first started, the diet of the human being, and those of you who are even mildly awake can understand that people have lived, the bulk of the diet has been on rice in the Far East, uh, in the, uh, the parts of Central America known as uh, Mexico and Guatemala and Costa Rica. That part of the world was occupied by Incas and Aztecs, excuse me, Mayans and Aztecs. Mm -hmm. And those were known as the people of the corn. Right. And those of you who have had the chance to travel to the Andes in South America have run into the, uh, the potato eaters. Uh, for example, the Incas, the traditional warriors, the Incas uh, lived on potatoes until they went to battle and then potatoes were too heavy, so they took quinoa. Wow. So the traditional diet of, uh, of people has always been starch. And the animal food consumption has been uh, limited, for obvious reasons, to the kings and queens, the aristocrats, the pharaohs, the priests and priestess. You know, you could date this back 4,000 years. Mm -hmm. And not only can you date their diet back by looking at the hieroglyphs and the pyramids, but you could also study their mummified bodies by autopsy or CT scans. So you could see that these people of 4,000 years ago who ate animals, like Americans, as the base of their diet, uh, had horrible atherosclerosis called that disease, even obesity, is the same problems as Americans. Yep. That was 4,000 years ago when there was no factory pollution. Uh, people got a lot of exercise by walking around. Uh, it's the food. Yeah. It's, it's just the food. And you don't hear too many stories about ancient rulers being kind. I'll tell you that. As Will Tuttle, Dr. Will Tuttle writes in the World Peace Diet, which I see happening now in the Middle East, you know, it's happening in Syria. There's a lot of anger and war and male domination happening in the cultures that eat the most meat. That's another video too, but you know, aside from, I mean, it's what we were talking about, the state of affairs of the planet. There's global warming happening because of our actions and volcanic eruptions, but mostly because of our actions, and these people are literally getting fried out of their homes. They can't stand the heat. They can't grow their own vegetables or fruits or, or you know, grains, starches anymore on the land because it's too hot. So they're 
going out of the land in droves like we're seeing in Syria right now. And there's so much anger and so much warring tendencies coming out of these places. And, I, you know, I've studied the ancients too and the kings, queens, pharaohs. I mean, I, there weren't very many nice ones. They wanted to control, dominate, murder, uh, you know, uh, attain land. So I think it's just, it's we see it now. The leaders of, of the countries of the world, it's, you know, the peasants bred. It's, it's the peasants that were healthier than the kings. It's the peasants that were the workers and the slaves that were taking care of the sick aristocracy. And, you know, it's unfortunate today that in this country the impoverished people are the sickest ones because they don't eat like their impoverished ancestors anymore. They eat like, God, fast food. It's, it's unbelievable. But, yeah, I mean, there's just so many consequences to eating this stuff and not going back to our roots like the gladiators to be warriors, starch, you know. Well, I'll tell you what. I will, I will not comment on your previous minute and a half discussion. <laughs> but I, with but I will. But I will. I will say that there's a serious dichotomy in the world. Yeah. And that is, there are probably half the planet. You know, there have been improvements in the last thirty years. Fewer people are starving to death. But still, there are lots of people who are starving to death and uh, and uh, suffering the consequences of uh, inadequate nutrition. But on the other hand, there's a, a more than half the world is suffering from overnutrition. So you could solve both problems by switching to a starch-based diet. Yes. The people suffering from overnutrition in the U.S., Canada, Europe, and now China and India, if they uh, gave up all their animal food intake and instead switched back to a starch-based diet, that would make available somewhere between 17 and 100 times as much food. And I say that because the consequences of uh, producing beef over, say, potatoes can vary depending upon how you look at it between 17 and 100 fold difference in the impact on the environment and the production of calories and or protein. So uh, we can solve both problems, uh, problems of uh, undernutrition and problems of overnutrition by, uh, by heading towards a starch-based diet. And uh, you know, I, I kind of look at it from that point of view, awareness of those who have the opportunity. But it, but it isn't just, and that's maybe a, a really good thing. It's not, uh, these days, it's not just the wealthy people have available televisions and other communication devices. Uh, in every, every part of the world that I see these days, when I watch newscasts, everybody, you know, if, even if they're from rural Africa, Totally. Or rural India. They got a cell phone in their hand. They got a gadget. So, yeah, you know, <laughs> this may be the great equalizer uh, in terms of what we need to have done is that cell phone is just held up. Uh, let, let's, let's, uh, let's believe that that's going to be the consequences. Let's believe what we're always true told, that the truth will win out. Yes, the truth that's shall prevail. What, and I love yeah. what you always say. In, in when I listen to you and your your webcast that if what you bring out bring out your talents bring out your passions bring out what you were put here to do it's it talked about in the Gospel of Thomas what you don't bring out will destroy you what you bring out will save you so bring out your talents bring out your your wisdom and your innate smarts not what you were taught on TV by a pharmaceutical ad or a fast food ad or a meat dairy egg oil ad Go back to reason and logic and let that prevail and bring out your own talents. And it's a lot easier to bring out your own talents when you're well-nourished and vibrant and not weighed down by poisonous intake of calories. And I love what you said about the affluent people being over-nourished. I, I call it the disease of affluence. That's what I call it. Like Just like the kings and queens. So treat yourselves like kings and queens in other ways, but not the way they ate. Don't be sitting down to any steak dinner. Sit down to a big fat potato steak, not made with oil. But what, okay, this is, here's my last question. If you can't put oil on your potatoes, which I don't, by the way, I eat no oil, thanks to you, Dr. McDougall, um, can you put coconut butter instead of coconut oil? Or is that the same thing, even though it's more of a whole thing? You know, I, I, I don't really know what coconut butter consists of, but coconut oil is toxic. 
Definitely. Uh, now, yeah. now, now, the, now, the coconut, uh, the coconut is healthy, but I have to, in my defense, say that the reason God put it in a hard shell is so that it was hard to get to. Yes. Uh, you know, it's rich food. Coconut's rich food. When you start processing any food, be it corn or barley or, or wheat or whatever you do, and in particular when you isolate the free oils, uh, you change it from a food uh, to a poison. And uh, so I, I don't really don't know what coconut butter contains, but okay. my guess is it's mostly coconut oil. Yeah. Well, it's 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 the blended up um, so of the what, coconut. What can you? What yeah. do you put on your potato? What do you? Uh, you know, Mary asked uh, a few minutes ago, Mary, my, my partner for 40, 45 years, asked what I'd like to have for dinner tonight. She still does, the, still does, always has done the bulk of the cooking around. Good work. And she said, well, you know, I think I'll make mashed potatoes tonight. She does that in an instant pot, which is a great investment. Buy one. And uh, she'll cook uh, whole potatoes with skins in an instant pot. And then she'll mash them in the instant pot, and she'll make a, a creamy gravy. Uh, one one version is with tahini, the other is without. And she'll make a creamy gravy, and we'll have that over the uh, instant pot boiled potatoes, which I think take 30 minutes to cook in this uh, particular gadget. And then she'll put the uh, creamy gravy over the top, and possibly boil some frozen corn, and maybe put a little sriracha sauce on top, and that'll be our dinner tonight. Uh, you know, a adding butter to a potato, the only reason you like it is because of the salt in the butter. Yeah. If you had saltless butter, you couldn't eat it. Or saltless cheese is unpalatable. So all you're doing is you're just putting a vehicle that contains salt on the potato. You might as well just take the salt shaker and put it on the potato. Right. Or you could use salsa. Or, you know, there's something I don't need to advertise it. I never even talk about it is we have a product called uh, uh, Dr. McDougall's Right Foods, nice. which is sold in over 6,000 stores across the country. And I just had, before we did this interview, I just had a tortilla soup, which is unbelievable, this nice. tortilla soup. And it's made uh, in, with really good ingredients and no oil and cooks up in about, uh, about three minutes with boiling water from your hot water machine. And you can throw that over a baked potato, or there's a pea soup that we make, or many, many other simple things you can throw over a baked potato. So the idea that butter and cheese are the are, are the uh, essence of this baked potato, it's just the salt right. that you're looking for. Right. Oh my gosh, yum, you're speaking my language. My mouth is watering. I, I need to go get myself an Instapot, hopefully non-Teflon. Uh, but no, that, that it's there's so many solutions, everybody. There's do you, you guys have so many cookbooks out, right? Or on well, we just uh, we just uh, again uh, uh, for fear that I'm going to detract from our conversation by advertising. I will no, show you that our I want book. I want to know. I want to advertise for you. You're incredible. Uh, everybody, get this book. Well, the, the latest book is called "The Healthiest Diet on the Planet." I think, as I said, you, the the best uh, book for sharing. Detailed information is the start solution, but what I did was I uh, Harper Collins Harper one came to me a couple of years ago and asked me to write a book and I said I'm not writing any more books <laughs> <laughs> But I but I said to them I will do a book is uh, the only book I want to do is my color picture book Which you see this, this color picture? Yeah uh, the, the color picture book, which by the way is free on my website, and it's in 24 different languages. Wow! It uh, it shows you pictures, and the reason I did a picture book, you know, some people when I tried to give interest in my picture book, they said this is a children's book. And I said no, it's not. These days, people don't read. Yeah. Uh, they have devices like you just showed me, and they look at pictures on the devices, and so. I got to Harper One to produce this book, which has become a very big seller for them. Yes. And it, it's something that you can hand or pick up yourself or hand somebody, and they can take 10 minutes and go through the pictures. They go, oh, my goodness, I get it. Okay. I understand why I'm sick, and I understand the solution, because I did it in 66 pictures. Amazing. Uh, so I would, uh, I'd encourage you to look for that book. It's on his website. It's on your website, drmcdougall.com. Yeah, well, we, we don't sell it. No. We don't sell it. You, you have to get it through Amazon. 
we're, we're out of the we're pretty much out of the book selling business. <clears throat> but pictures are so, on the pictures are on the oh, website. The color the color picture book, the color central part book. of this book, right, is on the website for free. Exactly. In twenty four languages, as are so many other things that are there for free. Amazing. And everybody from all those languages needs to go there because this epidemic of eating oil and dairy and meat and eggs and fish is going on all over the world. And it's not just a Western American disease anymore. We've spread our lovely tentacles out all over the world. So please get on to Dr. McDougall's website, get into his brain, his educated, logical, practical, reasonable brain, and pick it. Because you will learn so much, as I did, from watching him spew the truth about health all over the cyber waves. And I just am so grateful that you're part of the solution here, Dr. McDougall. I cannot thank you enough for being part of the solution. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk to your audience. Oh, of course. I hope, I, I hope we've at least opened a couple of eyes. Oh, we've opened a couple cans of worms and a couple eyes. Oh, yes, we have. So... Thank you for being part of Humanitarian Chronicles on Humor Healing Humanity, and I hope that we can have you on again to talk about some more specifics about health and vibrance for all of our health-curious listeners and viewers out there. You're amazing. Keep fighting the good fight. The, 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 the truth is simple and easy to understand, so it's not a big step for you. Is there anything else you want to say to our viewers out there? No, no, I just... Uh... Like I say, I hope we, I hope we've opened a few eyes. I hope so too. Uh, I hope so too. It, it, you know, it's it's not normal to be fat and sick. That's right. And out of control. That's right. And if it is normal, um, the sign of good health is not being well adjusted to a sick society. I think Krishna Marie said that. So if you think you're normal, right. look around. Go find a new normal, like Dr. McDougall and I have found. Find yourselves new normals and join us in the garden where we'll be munching on some potatoes mashed if you will and good luck to mary on the recipe tonight thank you you're awesome enjoy thank you so much dr mcdougall we'll see you soon uh drmcdougall.com you'll find all the info you're the best take care